morning, everyone, and welcome to tonight's installment of our Hawk Tank workshop series. And it's great to have everyone here on Fort Lewis College's campus, as well as everyone that's online joining us. Uh, tonight, what we're going to be doing is, is we'd like to sort of provide a little high-level um, informational session on sort of potential legal issues and concerns that you should be aware of. Uh, as a small caveat, uh, we are not lawyers. We are definitely not giving you legal advice. And so obviously, and of course this recommendation is going to come up numerous times this evening, um, we do recommend that when you are sort of doing some of these items that we're going to be discussing tonight, that you in fact go out and seek some uh, legal advice and legal help. We can kind of tell you where some avenues where you might be able to get some of that um, assistance. Uh, but we definitely, once again, this is not legal advice. We're just providing information and trying to assist you in terms of developing your business plans as well as for those individuals looking to start their business. Okay? So, here's what we want to talk about this evening. Please uh, do not hesitate to interrupt myself or Mr. Masner. Ask any questions you might have. Um, I think that's where we're going to see a tremendous uh, value from tonight. If you're online, we do have individuals manning our Facebook uh, chat, so please do not hesitate to ask any direct questions, and then they'll ask questions to myself and Mr. Masner. What do we want to talk about tonight? Number one is we want to talk about the different forms of businesses. We want to talk about intellectual property, and we want to talk about managing risk. Really, those are our three sort of key items that we'd like to talk about tonight. And then, of course, we want to provide you with some uh, direction in terms of where you can get additional resources and information on um, these types of topics. Okay? Any questions? Cool. So, let's first of all talk about the forms of businesses. Anyone want to take a guess on what that means? What does it mean to be like the form of a business? How we establish them. How we establish them, okay. Tax. For what? For tax purposes. For tax purposes, okay. What else? A lot of times you hear that this is how the business is organized, okay. Um, sort of there's, I mean, there's a variety of ways. If you look at the, the handout that you've all been provided um, this evening, and for those watching um, at home or online, please just send me an email. I can send you um, a copy of this. There are, there are numerous sort of organizational forms. Gary, you want to sort of talk about that piece at all? Sure. So, and again, um, it's really, they do uh, absolutely impact how you're taxed. Yep. They impact the risks. We'll talk about that in a minute. And you are operating under a set of corporate laws that are set up. Corporate law is run on a state-by-state -state basis. Uh, so there's Colorado corporate statutes that uh, talk about what you have to do under various uh, forms of entity structure that you uh, register with at the state. Uh, and it requires different uh, forms and different things and different requirements uh, that you have to meet uh, to do those. So let's talk about the simplest one is what's called a sole proprietorship. Uh, and there are roughly, I think, 35 to 40 million of those in this country right now. Uh, it is the most widely used one because it is the simplest one and because it is what, what people use when they just are starting their own small business, one or two people, uh, maybe none, maybe they're the sole proprietor um, and stuff. And you run it, you can hire people, you can have them, but as an entity, it is called a sole proprietorship even if you uh, even if you had an uh, unemployed. You are taxed as though it's ordinary income. You don't, you know, it's just as though you were paid by somebody almost. There are self-employment taxes, which is just doubling up on Social Security and, and Medicare tax and stuff. But it does not provide you any form of legal protection. We'll talk about that a little more as we step up through the, through the process. Um, you can have a partnership which is very much like a, um, a sole proprietorship, only there's more than one of you, but it's treated the same in a sense that you share uh, the profits, but you can set those at different uh, rates that you want to share. It doesn't have to be 50-50, but you're taxed in your share of the income, as though it were ordinary income to you, uh, and you have no protection uh, from liabilities. 
Uh, you can have. Jerry, can, I don't. I don't want to interrupt you, but what do you mean by that? I mean, just in case there's people watching now that they don't understand, like, what do you mean by being protected for liability? Right. So, so let's say there's uh, an accident at the, uh, or you get sued by a customer who doesn't like your product or damaged them or didn't respond like it should have. Uh, when you're, when, when you have that protection of a corporate, and uh, not a corporate, a structured entity. And there's a limited partnership, there's an LLC, which is a limited liability. It's liability that we're talking about. Limited liability corporation it stands for. Or if you're a corporation, you as an individual don't have that liability unless you specifically have done something absolutely wrong to create that. Um, in, a limit, in a sole proprietorship or a, uh, or, or limit, or a partnership, th there is none of that protection against those things. Obviously, you should be buying insurance in any mean, you know, whether you're doing it for the corporation or for yourself to protect against those things. But it has to do with, with what liabilities you have. For debts, if the company, uh, unless you've personally secured the debt through a bank, which, are, which you often have to do, um, a corporation, if it goes under and it files bankruptcy, you as a person, being an owner of that, a shareholder, an owner, uh, don't have a, a liability to pay that debt. As a sole proprietorship or a partnership, you absolutely have that um, that liability. So it's those kinds of business risks, liabilities, things like that, that, that get protected as you sort of go up the scale of what we're talking about as entities. Great. Yeah. So, you want to slow so, so we've introduced three of them. Can we introduce just really quickly corporations? Yeah, well, let, let me do the, yeah, we almost came, came I know, the, yeah, in a, yeah. an interesting order. Yeah. So limited liability company, oh, again, is is kind of a, it, it, it's, it's your, your members, you share an interest, you just say, you you own 20% of this, you own so-and-so, but you don't issue stock, you don't go through that process. Uh, you're just a partnership, if you will, sharing profits according to whatever formula you want. You have a managing partner, you have other people, you have to say what they're, you have to have an operating agreement that spells out those things out, but but that's all it is, you have membership. When you get to the corporation, yeah, sorry. Not to interrupt. But no, please do. As, as an individual, uh, you can establish this LLC and the same as a sole proprietorship. And exactly. Have all, so what would prevent someone from going that route? Is it more expensive or? Yeah, um, uh, you do have to register differently with the uh, state, not a big deal. You have to have an operating agreement I just mentioned, which tells in pretty big details how the companies run, who, who makes which decisions, how they're made. It's got some things like that. It's as much paperwork as the corporation, in my opinion. Um, and, but it gives, you that, it gives you that protection, that limited liability. Mm -hmm. So uh, you find a lot. There are single uh, owner LLCs. Pretty common, and and you'll see law firms and others, accounting firms. They'll either be an LLC or an LLP, um, which are pretty similar things actually. So, but good question. Okay. As a corporation, then. Yep, sorry. Oh, sorry. Just kind of to tag onto that for an LLC. Yes. Um, I've heard that you need a lawyer to go through and file the LLC agreement. That to file it. Or to. Well, it is part of the process, whereas a sole proprietorship you don't. Right, sole proprietorship you don't really have to put together these forms and documents. Yeah. Um, and you know you can go. There are online services that pretend to do it well, and in some ways they do. Especially, I'd say with an LLC, I wouldn't say that with a corporation <coughs> because there's some specifics there. But um, uh, so you can't go legal zoom is one of the one of the better known ones, right? Um, so you can do that, but. Uh, yes, you should probably, if you're going to LLC or a corporation, you should probably get a lawyer to at least review some stuff. And, and in a lot of cases, create them. But, and the rights are of a lawyer. We're going to say this a lot of times. Um, again, the, the accounting people, tax people, and even lawyers, um, you know, they serve their markets. And their markets are generally you know, not corporations and things like that. There aren't very many corporate lawyers or tax accountants or regular accountants around this area, for example. Um, and those people that do that charge more and harder to get and all that, but it's, it's really critical. You've got to find a way to get 
the right one uh, and spend the least amount of money, but it really is pretty important to do that. Okay, so now let's go to corporations. So corporations, there are something like, there are a couple of million of those, but every big public company obviously is a corporation, right? So you name the company, you have shareholders, you issue stock to those shareholders, they buy it. They're, if it's a public company, obviously they can trade it, but private companies can't, there are restrictions against that. You have a shareholder rights agreement that plays those out. Uh, you have bylaws that says here's how we're gonna run the company. Um, and if you get the right sort of lawyer, they will make it very simple and very flexible. In bylaws, you can essentially say the board runs the company uh, and, and you know we officers and people report to the board and the board essentially makes all the decisions and stuff or approves all of our actions and decisions. Um, and if you do it right, and I've seen a lot of them not do it right, you can do everything by written consent, you don't need meetings and things like that. But a corporation uh, gives you very good protection. Well, I'll talk about a couple other reasons why uh, corporations are sometimes valuable. Um, and, um, and I do want to point out an S corp then, and then we'll come back to corporations. So um, I find a lot of people uh, don't really understand fully what an S-Corp is. And an S-Corp is simply an organization, either a corporation or, or an LLC or an LLP uh, or a single person that chooses to be taxed as not as a corporation but as a sole proprietorship and entity and LLP. Okay. And there's some, there's some small tax values to that. But you'll hear some people sometimes say, well, we're an S-Corp. Well, S-Corp is how you're taxed. And it's only the IRS that cares about that. The state that controls you as a business in Colorado, if you're in the state of Delaware, if you're one of the big venture capital-backed companies, that's your form, the structure of your entity. The LL, an LP, an LLC, a C Corp. Okay, so you can be either of those. You can be an LLC and be treated uh, as an S Corp in terms of taxation. You can be a C Corp and be treated as an L, as, a, as an S corp, but it, it simply means you choose to be taxed not as a corporation, but you know as as pa it's called pass through. So all of the profits of the company are passed through to you as an individual or as a group of individuals if you have a partnership. So if you're a corporation, corporation doesn't pay taxes. You do uh, on whatever your share of the earnings are. So for instance, one of the big companies here in town. Of its S Corp is Stonebridge. So they're a corporation treated as that. But a whole bunch of other companies that are really LLCs and things and say we want to be an S Corp, and there's just a, there is a small savings in terms of, of payroll taxes. Okay. So so let me talk so let me talk about a C Corp. Um, uh, 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 there's been this belief in the past um, professed by, uh, whether it's lawyers or accountants or tax people, in my opinion, because they just don't want to, there aren't enough C-Corp potential clients for them to get uh, up to speed on, and so they just have, there are two sort of fundamental rules in the past about why it shouldn't be a C-Corp. One is it's too complicated. And, you know, I've run both kinds of companies and I would say that's not true. The second reason is what's been called in the past double taxation. So again, we talked before about taxation. When you are an S corp or sole proprietorship or any of those where it's pass through income, where whatever the company earns, you get taxed on your portion of that. That's pass through. If it's sole proprietorship, it's 100 percent pass through, right? Um, with a corporation, the corporation first pays tax, and then if they distribute any money to shareholders in the form of dividends, then those dividends are taxed as well. Um, and in the past, um, there was a pretty high corporate rate at a reasonably high, or pretty not that high, but a, a dividend tax rate, and that combination was typically higher than the pass-through ordinary income. Rate. That fundamentally changed with the uh, tax law that passed in 2017, which lowered the corporate rate to 21 percent, right? And uh, the other um, and, and you're still paying 20%, 15 to 20, depending on how much you get on dividends. So it lowered that, 
And there's one other thing that if any of you get to this point, it's called 1202. It's been around since 93, it's changed up and down, and nobody ever did it, and corporate tax was too high, but you get up to $10 million of tax-free gains on any stock you own in a startup company, qualified small business, it's called, less than 50 million of, of assets, which all of you are going to be less than 50 million of assets for a while, I'd say. Um, and, you know, frankly, we take all of our escape companies and really advise them that that's the reason to do it. You've got to hold the dollars for five years or reinvest it in another small business if you sell yourself within five years, unless you sell for stock, that's just a trade that keeps going. So $10 million tax free ain't too bad, right? So what was the, uh, we got one of our, uh, one of our startups who's, she's going to get what? More than 10 million, and she'll, 10 million of it will be tax free though. So what was that called again? Pardon me? What was that? 1202. It's IRS, you see, anytime you see these damn numbers, uh, it's uh, 1202, section 1202 of the IRS code. Yeah, sorry about that on tape. tape. No worries. Yeah. So, here, I, so here's one question, and, and I don't know, I'm sure some of our audience is thinking this. So they have their business idea, they're going to go write their business plan, and then they're like, okay, well, which one do I do? Yeah. So, uh, uh, so there are a couple of other uh, reasons to choose one or the other. If you're going to have, and it depends on what your plans are, how many employees you're going to have, how much investment you're going to want to take. Okay, so let's go through some of those trade-offs. And, and, I'll, and I'll go to the far end about those things that would lead you to go through the process of setting up a, a C Corp. Okay, um, so what you have to do, so you would do, you, you go through the process of a C Corp setup um, for a couple of reasons. One, you think you're gonna have a lot of employees and gonna be critical to the company and you'd like to offer them stock options can really only do that in a C Corp where, where you issue stock, right? And you can issue options for that stock. I've tried it in an LLC, and you can do it, but I'm telling you, nobody understands it, and it's incredibly complicated and expensive to set up. So stock options are very standard. You hear about it all the time out in Silicon Valley and in other places uh, and stuff. So if you're gonna have employees like that, really kind of critical. If you're going to bring in uh, investors, they like to invest in a C Corp, meaning they like to invest in stocks. Okay, they pay you, they pay you a dollar a share for your stock, whatever you charge them, and then they can sit back until you give them dividends or until you sell the company and they get their stock brought back. Right? So no real tax implication. In this pass-through entity form that we talked about, whether it's an LLC or an S Corp or anything else, you know, I pay. Um, so, uh, all the profits that come through from my Stone Age stock, for instance, because it's an S Corp, me as a shareholder, I have to show that on my, on my tax return. I get a K-1, it's called. That's the form that you get from these companies that shows your share of their profits. And it's just a hassle. They just don't like it. I don't like it, but, but I like Stone Age stock, so I put up with it. But, but uh, uh, investors just don't like them because they've got it now Every year they've got to get the K-1 from you and, and all of those things. And they just like cleaner deals investing in stocks. So that's, that's another key reason. 1202 is the third key reason if you can do that. And a fourth reason, you know, I can go both ways on this. Um, if you're going to sell the company, um, typically, it depends on who the buyer is and what the rationale is, but typically it's cleaner for them to buy the stock of the company. Okay, if they're buying a, a sole proprietorship or something, they're really buying assets. And sometimes they want to because they can uh, re-value uh, the asset to, at the fair market value and get a bigger a depreciation thing uh, from it uh, based on the price they pay. But, but in general, I would say if you're thinking about that, um, C Corp's a better decision. Flip side of it is, if you're just building a business and it's going to be you and maybe a couple of other people and you, you pay them a good wage, but you don't need to give them ownership, you're not going to have other partners in it and, and things like that, and you're probably not going to sell it or you're just going to run it a long time for it's, as a business of your own, you know, then there's nothing wrong with going the other direction either. 
and so. And the one other thing I'll throw out: they all, you know, the accounts like they talk about, gee, this double taxation still does exist in C corp. You have to pay 21 percent federal, that is 21 percent uh, tax rate on your earnings, and then if you dividend money out to the shareholders, they pay uh, 15 or 20 percent also. But most startup companies, you know, they don't do that. They need to keep the money themselves and grow the thing. And actually, when you look at that, there's only a 21% rate on that total earnings because you're keeping the money to grow your company. And in, and in LLCs or other places where you give it off, I guarantee you that you know 21% is less than those people are actually going to pay. So I, I find the tax rate lower for most growing companies that keep their cash. Any other questions? I have one more question. So I know when we get to sort of the financial modeling and you know we're gonna do like five years of forecasting and you know one thing that we're gonna really kind of I don't wanna say pound in your head, but really we're gonna really focus a lot on your assumptions, right? Where you're sort of saying, Oh, I expect to get this much revenue or it's gonna cost me this much. So when students and one thing we talk about and, and Mr. Masner um, historically has said is, look, don't worry about the taxes, right? Because there's so many other sort of moving parts, and this is kind of your initial, you know, uh, entry uh, into sort of this, this the startup or this, uh, you know, business plan. And so we want to try to make it as simple as possible. Um, would you expect, let's say, as a hot tank judge, um, to have sort of a line item in terms of lawyer expenses, especially for a startup? And then if the answer is yes, sort of, you know, how much should students think about sort of putting down there as a logical assumption? $15,000. Wow. Okay. That's cheap. I mean, we just, I'm going through, I'm helping this company, I think I mentioned this in the last one maybe, uh, they've got a, an offer from a private equity firm to buy them, it's a local company. Uh, pretty good amount of money, many, many millions. Um, and they're looking at, at uh, this is different, it's not starting it, okay? okay sure. Starting it is less, okay. they have to spend less time. Sure. They're, they're pretty standard documents. Um, that, and again, I'll go back to the C, the C Corp, for instance, or an LLC. Sure. You've got to go online and file uh, with the state. Uh, you can just say, you know, we're just going to accept your standard assumptions in your laws, so we're not going to actually give you some statements. Uh, that's wrong because, uh, and I won't go into the detail, but there's this damn thing called cumulative uh, voting uh, for, because um, shareholders always have to elect a board of directors of a C-Corp, okay? And if you don't say there's not cumulative voting, then you have to hold meetings, you have to give notices. If you say, if, if you don't say that, because that's what the state accepts, if you just say, to, if you just put this, document and articles of incorporation really easy to put together uh, and it says we don't have cumulative voting then everything can be held by written consent and move meetings and it simplifies says and how many lawyers know that unfortunately not as many as should okay, so, and if you go on legal zoom you won't get that uh, put in you'll just get this standard thing so it's worth spending money to find somebody that's going to give you uh, the correct advice there and so they're going to do that, they're going to do bylaws, which are, again, you have to have bylaws because they tell you how you're going to run the business. If you're an LLC, you've got to have an operating agreement that essentially tells how you're going to run the business. You shouldn't pay anybody to file for you online because the state sets that up and it costs 50 bucks, it's really easy. Once you do file there, then you have to go to the IRS and get an EIN, it's called, okay, an employer identification number. And you do this even if you're a sole proprietorship, just to have one for the company, often you won't use it because you won't file separate tax returns, but if you do, you should always have one of those. Again, simple to do online, get you a nice thing, you need to take that down when you set up your bank accounts. Now, would you say that $15,000 would be the amount if you were going to do like a sole proprietorship? No, sole proprietorship, you don't need that. Even a partnership, you don't need it. If that's really for an LLC or a, or a C Corp or, you know, then the S Corp uh, portion of that, but a lawyer doesn't add anything to the S-Corp decision. That's really the LLC or the C-Corp or like. Look, 15000 is really more than you should have to spend. So I mean, uh, like for the student, just so the student, like I mean, the student has no idea, 
right? I mean, is it something where if they, you know, if they're starting a, a smaller business, is it, you know, and if it's obviously the sole proprietor, you wouldn't expect it, maybe even have any. Right, you wouldn't. I would. Uh, well, nothing for that. You might have something for your NDA. Well, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, but, but, but just for that. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Because I just want to. I think if I was, you know, at home right now, you know, I'm like, and I was looking at sort of my my rough financials. I think throwing 15k on top of that. I mean, that's a lot. So I just want to make sure that we, we clarify. Yeah, okay. yeah. Cool. And again, you should have, you know, you, you, there should be rationale to, to say that 15000 was spending, and it sure. should be have to do with the size of the business Absolutely. you're trying to build, where you think Perfect. it's going to go, and so forth. Awesome. Now, I thought you were also going to ask tax. Uh, sure, please. And, and I'm just saying we'll get into this more in the financials, but I think in general um, we say uh, in this process, at least in the hub tank, Plan competition. Yeah. Don't don't worry about taxes, okay? Because probably years, you know, nobody makes money from day one. Or if you do, let me know. I'll, I'll invest in your business for sure. But um, and and you don't. And there are a whole bunch of other things you get. And so you're not going to pay taxes. You're probably not going to know what they are. Have an idea of what they are. So we just ignore it. And the way companies are valued. It's always this earnings before interest taxes and depreciation. So you can just ignore that. So we don't expect you to try to come up with a detailed uh, analysis of what your tax bill is going to be in, in the first five years. Eventually, if you're doing really well, you're going to pay the taxes, but that's not what we're And then once again, we'll cover more of this when we get into the, the finance aspect <laughs> of it. Once again, uh, don't forget we have Beta Alpha Psi supporting Hawk Tank, our international our society for finance and accounting. And so they're actually going to be coming in a couple weeks and they're actually going to be helping Mr. Master for one session. And then they're actually going to be running their own session to help support all your efforts in terms of forecasting, modeling, and assumptions. And so we have, your, we have you guys covered. And use them, by the way. They're yeah, they're running, amazing. Running things they're absolutely amazing. amazing. Okay, any more questions on this? Anything at all? No. Okay, let's go to intellectual property. Uh, I've had uh, the opportunity to talk to a number of you, and I think for many of you, this is going to be an area of interest and also an area of concern. What's intellectual property, Arlo? It's protection on like designs for products. Uh, and your ideas. Sure. Yeah. So, how are you going to protect your ideas? Okay. Uh, is a big part of it. And so tonight we just want, we, there's a lot of different types of intellectual property. Uh, tonight we just want to sort of briefly sort of introduce four different specific areas. Uh, we want to talk about copyright, we want to talk about trademark, we want to talk about patents, and we want to talk about trade secrets, okay? And definitely it's all about protecting your ideas, your processes, Okay, that's what we're looking to do when, talks, when we're talking about intellectual property. Okay, so let's start with copyright. What's copyright? What is it? Uh, some of you know, I bet you were fast. What is it? What do you think it is? Do you remember, Taylor? Copyright, no, I confused this in trademark. Okay. Creative works. Creative works, expression of ideas, I think it's kind of what we hear too, right? Um, you know, your art, uh, your poetry, uh, let's say you're into no. dance, right? Choreography, guess what? You can copyright that. Software. Software, absolutely. Which is almost automatically given copyright protection, unlike a lot of other things sure. where you have to you sure. have to file for a copyright. I was just actually gonna ask you, how many of you have copyrights? How many of you in this room? What if I told you you all should be raising your hands? <laughs> because you all do have copyrights. Now, you may not have registered those copyrights, and so you may not actually get those protections uh, from the US government for that copyright, but guess what? You all have copyrights. Yeah. You know, the, the essays you write or the things you're writing for class, well, you know, don't put that on the internet. Give somebody the ability to sell that to another Classmates, or you copyright it so you get paid for no, it. No, seriously, right? it's yours. Okay. The only difference is, is that you just don't have that protection if you haven't, in fact, filed or registered it. So let's say someone stole, you know, your idea or stole, let's say, a piece of poetry that you presented here at the fort. 
then yes, then you would have to kind of show that there was value there, that you were hurt by that, that they had taken that value, and then therefore you'd probably get, you know, reach some of those benefits. I can write on this wall, right? Sure, of course, absolutely. Now, in terms of, you know, how you're long... You're going to see that in a lot of, whether it's the text after a, uh, an advertisement in a thing, or a, 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 a thing in an, an article, people sure. write a thing, that, that's, that means it's copyrighted. It's a little... C inside a circle. And then in terms of for the length of protection, if you're if it's a company, uh, it's for 95 years. If it's for an individual, it's for your lifetime plus 70 years. And the idea behind your lifetime plus 70 years is so actually your your family or whoever, let's say you give those rights to, can actually benefit from those also. And music is the big one, right? Sure. Songs, music, you see those, and you know gets passed on to their, to their, to whoever they leave it to. It's interesting, what do you know about like sort of the, in terms of the, the, the amount that you recoup per infringement? Do you know it, it, I, it all depends on the, I, it, 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 there's nothing specific that I know of, I okay. it all depends on you know, how much you were harmed sure. by the infringement. Okay, I, I mean some stuff that I've sort of you know, read was that if it's registered, that you'd actually get access to that sort of that, that minimum amount, which is actually 25000 Is that it? Yeah. It's pretty okay. darn high. Okay? And so that's, once again, one of those benefits of registering and actually, you know, registering your, your copyright. Um, you know, and oh, here's another key point. Some of you in my talking to you um, about your idea, about sort of where you think your competitive advantage is, uh, in terms of the resources you think you need to succeed. A lot of you talk about sort of outsourcing certain things, right? Outsourcing software development, right? Outsourcing app development, outsourcing logo creation. Any ad creation, any of those right, things. Right, any of those things. If that is the case, then when you have that contract with whoever's helping you, you need to make sure that they assign that copyright ownership to you. Because if that does not happen, then guess what? You might be in for some trouble. And, and, and it's not just copyright, it's patent, it's absolutely absolute. So you have, and, and it's, by the way, let me just add, it's not just outsourcing. Make sure any employees you hire, they sign a, an agreement with you, an NDA, non-compete, we'll and combine the two of them together. Absolutely. But if, if they're working on something, they can walk out, if you don't have something like that, they can walk out the door. Now you can still get them under trade secrets and other sure. things we'll get to, but you are a lot better protected and they're a lot more cautious, and anybody that hires them is really cautious, um, if you've got these contracts signed that says anything you develop well, you're an employee of this company, it belongs to the company, not to you personally. And there have been some huge arguments over that and huge court battles and other things over the years because it wasn't taken care of. So again, fairly standard, fairly straightforward. Doesn't that even have to be perfect? You don't have to spend a lot of money with a lawyer on it, you find some good ones online. But you ought to have something in place for every single employee. And by the way, for every single co-founder. We'll talk about that a little bit sure. in a moment too, because the co we've, we've seen a lot of those. Whether it's Facebook, I can give you five or six companies sure. where guys, you know, they weren't founders anymore, but they claim they're part of it or they had the rights and stuff like that. And, that. and that's actually number seven right here. These common mistakes, these these some like, of these potential pitfalls, right? Number seven is is you start developing your idea, your business uh, with a company you're working with that actually might turn to be a competitor. If that happens and you have signed any of these sort of arrangements, these agreements, then guess what? It's going to belong to the company you work for. Okay? And so we want to be really, really mindful of that. Uh, you know, another sort of, I think, concern or potential issue for you all, we talked about copyright, is I know that we love the access to information online. We love the access to photos. I see it when students present in my classes, where, oh, I need a cool picture, or, oh, I need some type of theme. So what do you do? You go to Google Images, you search it, right? You copy it, you put it on your, you know, your presentation, you put it on your own individual work. Well, guess what, y'all? You don't own that, and really, it's theft, right? And so that's something that we have to be mindful of. Okay, now, 
there's obviously sort of different you know, levels. Are you doing it for educational purposes? Are you selling it? Or how are you using it? But we, we want to be really mindful when it comes to we start borrowing this material, especially if, if you think you're going to be able to monetize it. Because once again, it has to be yours. Okay? And, and, and or you have to get the right to use or it. Or get the right. Getty Images, I think, all awesome. requires that from you. Absolutely. Right? You have to pay something to be able to use that, and then you're allowed to use it. Yeah. So. Perfect. Any questions on copyright? All you copyright owners? Yeah. Okay, trademarks. What's a trademark? Anyone? What do you think a trademark's for? Phrases. Phrases? Names. Names, okay. Names, designs. Well, it identifies your company, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know why we have trademarks? Are we protecting the company? I think in general, when you think about trademarks, the way I like to think about it is actually you're, you're actually protecting the consumer. And of course, as a, as a sort of you know, spin-off of that, of course, you're protecting the company too. But we're thinking about sort of the protection of the customer. It's this, is that the individuals know what they're getting, okay? Right, there's trademarks, there's service mark. Obviously, if you don't have a product, okay, it'd be something called a service mark. Uh, it can be words, it can be symbols, it can be phrases, absolutely. Totally spot on. And the goal is, is that we don't want confusion in the marketplace. Right? So if you trademark a certain, uh, a certain let's say, you know, word, and that is actually directly sort of related to a business, you don't want someone using that word. Right? Because what if they mess it up? What if they mess up the product? They get poor service, they hurt someone. Right, and so that's where we're talking about. Or counterfeit kind of your product and put your trademark even, on it. Yeah, absolutely. Even even there, right? Um, do you guys know any service marks? You do. Can you think of any? Can you think of any businesses that provide services that have a trademark? <clears throat> any financials? Okay. Sure. I mean, we just actually went over our creativity class, right? FedEx, right? Yeah. FedEx is a service mark, right? The one that has like the hidden little arrow in the logo that we talked about, Taylor. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Smile under Amazon. Yeah, the smile under Amazon, right? Going from A to Z, right? We saw that in today's class also. Um, now, we have to be careful, right? What happens if your name uh, gets genericized? Scotch tape. Scotch tape. Kleenex tissues, right? Why do you think Kleenex does not call themselves Kleenex? Because they don't want to genericize it because guess what? That's how you lose your trademark, right? What does Kleenex say? Kleenex brand tissues, right? And they make a special point in saying that. Okay. And in part because they didn't trademark it when they should have and it got used Exactly. Right? I mean, think about it. What other, what other words out there do you think that might happen to? What other sort of companies out there that I think it, they're really, it might happen? I think the backcountry.com thing. You think that might be one? Which one? Sorry. Backcountry.com. They tried trademarking the name and they were seeing a lot of different, like they tried suing backcountry experience and then Okay. They dropped it. They dropped in. What about Googling it? Right? Did they say Google Brain Search Engine? No. I mean, I go look at my parents, right? Like, that's totally, like, my mom she says she's Googling it, right? And what she means, she's searching, you know, she's been out and using Google Search Engine, right? So maybe binging it. Yeah, she might be, absolutely, Gary. And so I think that's just one of those things that we need to be aware of. But that's what we're talking about, what we're talking about. Uh, you know, trademarks. Um, was there, uh, I mean, besides the FedEx and Amazon Smile, what other service marks are good examples of that? Like, can you put a service mark on what you do, or? Well, what do you mean by what you do? Just like specific. a service, like if you offer, like, well, I guess, I mean, you can, 
uh, you, you see almost every company these days, okay, Mercedes-Benz, what's their, what, what, what's, what's the clause under every Mercedes-Benz ad you see? I forget what it is myself, but it's like, uh, you know. We got Otis Elevator, or Otis, I think does that one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But you know, those, those kinds of, you know, the, every company almost now has something that tries to have them stand out, right? And whatever that is uh, under it, that's, you know, a service mark or a trademark. Oh, and, and and the thing about, sorry, go ahead. Just slogan. Just slogan. Slogan. Sure, yeah. absolutely. Right? Now, in terms of how long you have your trademark, if you're registered, it's 10 years. But you can actually have it indefinitely. But you have to renew it after every 10 years. Do you think... Um, I'm trying to think of an interesting story. Oh, I got one. Um, was there an Apple trademark in the 60s? Yep, yeah, there was a big Apple. fight. There was. Before the Apple. Absolutely, right? Head face on. So there was, right? So there was, there was actually... Wasn't it the Beatles? It was. So, so. Absolutely, right? So Apple, in the 60s, right, if you ask your grandparents, Right, Apple Records, right? I actually have some old vinyl from my parent, my mom. Really? You know, and it's actually Beatles, because that was actually the Beatles label. So in the 1960s, you have Apple Records, right? Then what happens is you have Apple Computers. And guess what? Apple Records goes on and sues Apple. It says, hey, you totally have trademark infringement. Okay. People are going to get confused They're between computers confused. and Absolutely. LPs. They're going to be totally confused about who's actually, you know, what the company is, what they're actually delivering. And so guess what? They reached the settlement. What do you think the main caveat of that settlement was? Apple computers. And Apple and came back in. Uh, no, not computers. I like that. That's great. Super smart. The settlement was this. That's all fine and dandy, Apple, but you cannot get into the music industry. <laughs> Which in a sense they are now. But so, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. did they follow that? No, right? I mean, once you had that, you had the music players, number one. Then you have iTunes, then you have iMusic. So do you think Apple Records just stood by and said, that's cool? Absolutely not. Okay? So Apple Records says, okay, you totally infringe on our agreement, and so we want something in return. So I don't know the specific amount, but uh, I have a friend of a friend who actually saw the amount. Okay, nine figures. Oh, wow. jeez. Okay, nine figures. So Apple could continue to use Apple in terms, in, in sort of, you know, in terms of their business. This is kind of unrelated, but sure. like. I have an idea for a product and I've got my brand name, but for a model name I want to use like the space case, which I know has been used before, okay. um, not in a related field or nothing that I've seen, but I know that there's like a marijuana grinder that's called the space case, but that's the actual brand name of okay. the grinder. And I just walking that line and figuring out if I'll be able to call this model of product under that name, I'm, I'm going to have to go get legal yeah, advice. Yeah, I don't Jerry. So, it, um, right, we call it that because that's all we were doing at one time was building uh, software systems for municipalities to collect sales tax. Now we've got these other things and actually that's the smallest part of our business, but we're still called Munireps because that's the name of the company. We should have come up with a more generic Call, I, I don't know what to call it, government so, local government software corporation, but something like that. We should have been more general. So, you know, when you're coming up with names, think them through, but do do a search. Now, and it's state by state, by the way, the way these things are set up, because that's where the entity uh, forms and does that, okay? So if you think you're going to be in other states, check some other states' uh, sites too and make sure you're not infringing. Will they come after you? If they think there's confusion in, in customers, that's customers' eyes, like Dr. Brothers was talking about, then yeah, they could come after you. And I've seen some of that happen when it's you know even more unrelated than Apple Music and Apple Computers. So. Just to go a step further with this, I, I do plan on pursuing getting a patent for this device. Oh, okay. Once having a patent, will that 
paid in getting a trademark or, you know, well, what, would that aid once having? Oh, no, no, you don't have. To, you don't need aid in getting a trademark. But no, 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 no. Once I have a patent, like, and I let's say I use this space case for the model name, yeah. does that give it more validity? No, patent doesn't give you any right to use a name that somebody else had already trademarked. Yeah. That doesn't. That those, those are totally separate. So that's not going to help. As a matter of fact, don't wait. Go to get the trademark because it's going to take you a year and a half to two years to get your patent. Sure. Uh, Assigned, so get the trademark set up first, because then when the patent gets done and you've got that and you want to be using it and you can't use it, and now it's a little confusion. Cool. All good. Yeah. Awesome. So let's go to patents. How many think they might have a product for patent? One, two. Wow. Good. Okay. Okay. So, you know, ways to protect obviously your inventions, right? Uh, you know, your your novel ideas. Okay. Uh, anyone know how long you're protected for? Twenty years. Twenty years. Good. I'm liking that. Um, here's the thing with patents: is you are going to have to apply for a patent. It is going to take quite a long time, right? Um, and the thing with applying for a patent is you have to disclose pretty much everything, except in the provisional application. Right. Right. Okay, but once again, you are ultimately going to disclose, hey, this is how, this is the bells and whistles, this is how it works, okay? And I think that's something that we need to be somewhat mindful, and I'll give you an example of a company that's, that's opted not to actually file patents anymore. Okay, they want to go more on a trade secret sort of route, we'll kind of talk about that. Now, uh, we are so lucky in, in Durango, Colorado, because uh, of the sort of approximately 50 sort of offices, uh, patent offices in our country, we actually have one here. And this is a tremendous resource, not only for our community in Durango, but obviously in the Four Corners area. And what that means is, is you have help to look for, hey, does this patent already exist? Okay, hey, how do I sort of take this idea and sort of do that next step? Now, once again, as Mr. Mazur and myself have already said, you are definitely going to have to hire uh, some legal help to sort of take you through everything, okay? But these initial searches, as well as access to sort of resources to help you, is available in Durango at the Durango Public Library. At the library. Uh, it is amazing. You just walk up the second, up the second floor of those stairs, and you literally will hit the patent uh, desk right in front of you. So please, do not hesitate to reach out to them. They are just, they're waiting for you. They would love to help you uh, as you know, with your, with your ideas uh, moving forward. And it's called prior art that you're searching, right? That's the terminology they give. In other words, if what you're saying, you and there are two kind of patents. There's a design patent, which is just, this is my design, nobody can exactly copy it, but they can make really small uh, changes to it and get around it. So a design patent isn't all that, I mean, it helps. Texture design means somebody can't copy it without infringing and therefore you can go after them. And if you didn't have that, they could do that. And then there's a utility patent, which is really talking about this is something really uh, uh, in how it operates, how it's used, how, you know, something more than just what it looks like. Yeah, so it's so that's the create, real valuable one. Right. And there is a third one, right? Uh, it's called a plant util uh, a plant patent, yeah. right? Um, you know, I don't know. I, don't, I mean, obviously, I think you know, in the marijuana industry, I think there's going to be just a huge explosion if that ever started to legalize federally. Obviously, for hop tank, that is not an option, okay? Uh, because we won't, we're not uh, allowed to have any any marijuana products um, or items in the competition. Uh, but that is sort of that is another patent. I mean, there's it's a lot the of genetics of the yeah, CSU, right? Colorado State University. That's a big part of that university system, and they have lots of patents. That's sort of the state's agricultural school, so that was sort of what you would expect. And, and so you've got to be very careful, because as soon as you publicly talk about, show, do anything about what, what your product is, you know, you're, you've, you've started a clock that you can't, you know, you can't show people that and then file a patent later. Okay, so you've got to get NDAs, you've got to say this is confidential, you can't make quote public. You could have, you could talk to somebody about it, show it to them if you've got an NDA, but you've got to be very careful about it. Sure. And then there is a thing called a provisional patent, 
But all that does, and it doesn't cost that much patents. You know, it's another fifteen to twenty-five thousand dollars to get through a patent uh, thing with all you have to do. I have it written up by a good patent attorney to make sure the prior art has been reviewed, that there are no claims that's going to invalidate it to, to prevent you from going through it, or that you have to rewrite your patent to kind of get around those prior art uh, claims and things. But a uh, provisional patent, essentially, all you have to do is say, here's my thing. You don't have to make individual claims. But it costs, I want to say $2,000 to file it. And it, it really protects you for a year. Within a year, then, you have to file your actual uh, patent application. And then that's going to take two years for them to get through the process. Artificial intelligence could do it in a nanosecond, but that's down the road. Uh, so um, uh, provisional patents really worth thinking about getting that in place, kind of protect your idea. You can begin to talk about some of the public things and then make all your specific claims in the actual uh, more detailed uh, application. Great. How much would the uh, utility patent run? The You're utility, looking at the utility patent, patent, yeah. Just curious, like, how much, yeah, ballpark that could run up to. Well, I'm using 15,000 again. I seem to be locked into that number, but, you know, <laughs> uh, if you're going to have to um, have somebody really who's good at writing it up, make sure it's, you know, and there's certain words, there's certain things, and there's certain, you know, that just the patent um, people that are back there working in the, in the U.S. Patent Office, um, you know, they just respond to so you know the more the more you get somebody that really knows what they're doing and and, and has looked at the prior art either they're going to do that themselves it, it is a patent attorney that will write it up they can use other people to do and you can do it yourself you go to the library you should start there you can really understand where you're starting from but you know they're really going to want to know about any prior art prior claims other patents that have been issued that impact yours so that either you don't shouldn't bother going through it because you don't have anything new and you might even be infringing somebody else's. Uh, or, you know, you can run, you can write patents around a lot of things. We get, at Stone Age, they're huge, spend a lot of money. It costs well over 100000 a year on patent attorneys to protect them, to file new ones, to watch them. It's, sure. it's an expensive process. And then if you expand international, yeah. not, yeah. not, not that we're going to go there for hot tank, but then, actually, is you're going to have to sort of file in every individual country. A patent is only good in the country it's right. issued. It's that, it's got that, to go. It's like, yeah, exactly. And even in Europe, there's, you'd think there'd be a European Union patent, but there isn't. It's every country in Europe, and obviously China, you know, and all the rest. You got to, you got to. So it's expensive. It's a very laborious. Um, is there any? Is there any sort of? I mean, maybe you guys have heard of this. I'm curious. Um, is there any times where you think a patent, maybe a company saying, you know what, maybe I won't go a patent route, but I'd rather just keep it a trade secret? Coca-Cola? Coca-Cola? I mean, it definitely is a trade secret, right? They didn't go patent. I would say like a lot of food and drink industries okay. would want to keep that because you could just take out a little bit of one. You can take out one ingredient and it'll still taste very similar, okay. but then they can sell that. So I think a lot of chefs... It's really stuff. products that your competitors can't look at and figure out exactly how it's made, what's in it, how it operates, right? Coke is the classic example. It's hard to break that down chemically and figure out. Nobody's been able to do that yet that I know of. Right, no. I mean, the one that always sort of comes to my mind, I think, of was Google's algorithm for searching. Mm -hmm. When they first sort of came out, they actually did patent the original algorithm for Google for the search engine. But then the concern became was, hey, if we show them the guts, then what Connor's saying is maybe they can make a, a slight adjustment, and then guess what? People then can either leapfrog us or at least maintain with us and so they opted just to keep it as what like Mr. Mander was saying, so employees are signing NDAs or signing non-compete agreements, and so they want to keep it in terms of a trade secret as opposed to sort of having to sort of once again show the guts on exactly what we're doing. So that could give you, you know, that's that's a big decision. Okay? Um, that's a huge decision. So trademarks, obviously you never want to disclose a trademark or uh, sorry, trade secret. Okay, it, the value comes from no one knowing what's in it, right? Coca-Cola is a great example, okay? 
You guys know of anyone that maybe knows the whole formula? <laughs> Did I tell you the story? Yes, yeah. it was the, uh, oh, not a priest. Um, so so the story is actually there's a rabbi, rabbi yeah. right? So Coca-Cola wanted to make sure that, uh, I don't want to say make sure, but they wanted to sort of make it accessible to individuals that follow, you know, Judaism. And as you may or may not know, uh, the, the food or drinks need to be kosher. So it needs to sort of follow a certain procedure. It needs to be overseen by a rabbi, sort of approved by a rabbi that that procedure is followed before it sort of is kind of gets the, that it's kosher, you know, the, the mark that is kosher, and then you can consume that. So Pepsi Cola actually now has kosher, or like during Passover time, Coca-Cola obviously wanted that also. And so what they did is they hired a rabbi. The rabbi had to sort of sign NDAs and things of that nature, went through the entire process, understanding what goes into it, how they produce it, and therefore that's why uh, you'll even see that. Like let's say, I think even like a, I think for Pepsi products, it's actually the yellow cap. If you ever see that like during the seasons, that's when you know that that specific product is kosher. There's also the kosher symbol on the labels also, right? That's just one sort of example of this idea of, sort of, of protecting these trade secrets because the value is, once again, in people not knowing it. Any other sort of trade secrets y'all know of? Anything else? Really? Come on. What's up, man? What's that? KFC, right? I mean, I know people have reverse engineered, or they, just, they, they think they've reverse engineered. Of course, Kentucky Fried Chicken, you know, brands always say, well, you're closed, but no, right? How do you protect trade secrets? Don't tell anyone, okay? Right? I, I'm serious, okay? I know you guys are laughing, but really. But once again, those NDAs, non-competes, that's what those are there. Those and are I, there and I forget also. which one it was. I think it was the guy that left uh, Google's Way Waymo or whatever their self-driving is went to Uber, sure, and he was sued for taking their Absolutely. trade secrets of what they were doing. Absolutely, they were doing it. I mean, so there's a lot of those. I, sure. you know, I, I can't remember all the examples, but it's amazing how many there are. And again, you know, when, uh, Uber had to fire the guy, and, and things were yeah. cut back and things. Absolutely, like but it, again, it gets back to why you need to have those agreements with any of your employees about. You know, not because they're going to be involved in it. They're going to know the trade secret because sure. they're working on it, right? Of so you've got to make sure that those NDAs that they sign that they can't, you know, use that can't can't to give it to anybody. And there have been a couple of examples where people have left and they said, "Oh yeah, I went to this competitor because I didn't have a non-compete." That's uh, California. That's a state-by-state -state thing too. And California uh, doesn't really allow it very much. Um, and he said, yeah, I went there, but I didn't tell him any of the trade secrets or anything. Well, yeah. That's sure. hard. Yeah. That's hard. We can part uh, Great. Any questions on this? Let's talk about managing risks. Okay. One of the big challenges, uh, one thing that we want to avoid are these sort of the unknown unknowns, right? That's, that's the ones that will keep you up at night. Uh, you're not really sure sort of what's going to happen, and we have to kind of understand how can we manage for some of this risk. What type of insurances do you think, Gary? Do you think with, I mean, I think general liability? General liability for sure. Okay. What other type of insurances do you think? Well, the, the, the other, the, uh, another major one is um, directors and officers liability. Uh, insurance. Sure. That tends to be relatively expensive, and we don't, we've never, uh, at least with our escape companies, and most of them I've been involved with, uh, gone to that level. Obviously, public companies have that, other, you know, large venture backed uh, companies where, the, where there's any kind of a risk. And those kinds of risks are, it's not like the boardroom's going to burn down or things like that. It's just, you know, did the board, did an officer do something that harmed? A competitor, a customer, a supplier, whatever it is, uh, or, or an employee because they did something wrong with things and stuff. So, but that's expensive. But general liability doesn't cost that much. You ought to, as a company, have that. That's customer comes, a supplier comes in and slips on your floor. A customer, your own employees are going to have 
uh, you've got to buy um, insurance uh, under some things for um, workers' comp. You've got to get that. That's the one I was going to just yeah, on. That's, that's, that's not even a choice. If you have employees, you've got to have know, that. Just, that's, exactly. It's not a choice. It's, you have to have that. Um, and we're not going to spend time kind of going through all of them. If uh, if you want sort of access to you know to individuals that this is their expertise, I once again think that you know when I think about your your portfolio of experts that you need for your business, obviously you're going to want a lawyer, you're going to want an accountant, and I think you're going to want a really good insurance agent to kind of help you sort of through this process. Um, even for Hawk Tank, if you're interested in sort of hey, getting some of that support, then definitely come to me. Uh, we have individuals in the community like uh, Ben Freehoff who would love to meet with you. Uh, he owns um, an, an agency in town, uh, and we can definitely hook you up through other individuals also if you really kind of want to drill down in that part. Chuck? Was the individual that works in the library for copywriting, or was he? There was an individual that came to one of the workshops last year. Yeah, so that individual, he was our copyright librarian, and he actually has since uh, moved on. He's actually now the business and engineering librarian at ASU. So he's actually down at the, the main campus. Uh, but uh, Reed Library will have those resources. You just go in there and see what they have. Absolutely. Great question, Sean. Yeah. So, so the one other one, and again, it gets very specific about what it is that you're offering. But product liability is different than general liability. So general liability is, you know, it's not related to your products, it's related to something that happens in your facilities or things like that. Product liability is incredibly important if you have a product that could harm somebody. And, you know, you can stretch out those harms. So Stone Age has this thing, incredibly high water uh, pressure things to clean things. And, you know, people have, been inattentive and dropped these shotguns and done terrible damage to themselves and stuff. And so they have to have product liability. I, don't, I just read uh, IKEA just paid $46 million to one family who okay. had a three year old who there, they have the, the uh, dressers that could fall over easily, apparently. I mean, I don't for me to believe a three year old could do it. But one family, one incident. $46 million. They'd already recalled those products, but apparently had not, at least somebody says, had not reached out specifically to this family who they knew had one and stuff. So things like that. It's, it's amazing that, you know, in, in the years that I've been in business, if you will, how these, these the costs, the, the settlements of, um, you know, these kind of product things have gone up. I mean, a, a life never used to be viewed as worth $46 million, I'll tell you that in the old days. So it's just getting, it's getting really, really high. And obviously that raises insurance rates too, right? Because it's in the end, typically, I, mean, I'm, I guarantee you, IKEA has insurance, and so it's an insurance company that paid that. And so it's pretty expensive, um, but it's a cost of doing business if you've got that kind of a problem. Um, so would this apply to food service and food products as well? Okay. Well, well, I, you know, that's a good point. I think it would. Uh, certainly all the lettuce farmers that, you know, or these others, you know, that have the, that raised it and caused that or when it was processed. So, yeah, I'd say probably does. Right. Now, if you're a normal, well, it depends. It'd be, it'd be a really good question to ask the restaurant. I have no idea whether the restaurant has to get product liability or not. We can definitely, we can hook you up, you know, if you want to sort of drill down with like restaurant owners, we can drill down. Um, obviously, um, Mr. Freehoff can obviously help with this too. And I think it's kind of interesting when we think about some of these, you know, general liability insurances, you know, they'll help you with an attorney too. Because a lot of these sort of, these policies actually, they actually will help you and hire and help you pay for those attorneys, right? I mean, do any of you now actually have any insurance that uh, will pay for your attorney? Anyone? No? Anyone even have car insurance? Yeah, then raise your hand because guess what? It's part of your policy. Okay? And so this is where we think about these insurance, we think about managing risk, we think about sort of getting access to these resources to help you. This is why this stuff is really critical <coughs> for your success. And really kind of looking, you know, maybe not so much in terms of the hot tanks or a business plan competition. I think we need to definitely address these, these high level issues. Uh, but definitely as you move or sort of graduate from hot tank into scape, et cetera, then guess what? You are going to have to do this for real, okay? 
and it's going to be really critical to your sustainability um, that you, in fact, do this. Okay. As a matter of fact, I'll just say this personally, and it has nothing to do with Octane, but when you graduate from college and get started in your careers, you ought to buy your own individual, essentially general liability policies. They sell them, cost about three hundred dollars a year for two to five million dollars of coverage. So again, yeah, somebody slips coming up on your walkway, or you know, an icicle falls off your roof and hits. Whatever it is, those kinds of things are covered. It's essentially general liability for individuals. And believe me, you all love that. Cool. So another way to protect y'all is going to be contracts. This is going to be another way in which you are going to be managing your risk. Okay. Um, if you want investors for your ideas, like Mr. Masters already said and alluded to numerous times, hey, it may make sense to have them sign an NDA before you sort of move forward and kind of share exactly everything that you're going to be uh, you're going to be doing. Now, by the way, a lot of them won't sign that, but but oh, right. they're afraid. But you sure. should ask for sure. Yeah. yeah, and even like let's say with an hot tank, I know a number of you have kind of asked us about NDAs. And if you go and sort of look at sort of our rules for Hawk Tank, we explicitly say that we do not have sort of signed NDAs, but also that you know our judges are sort of operating under sort of this idea of this sort of you know implicit sort of NDA, right? And that's kind of what we have here, just because it is um, it'd be really challenging for us to get um, all of that for you. Okay. In all the years I've been here, I've only stolen three items. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I'm actually not a judge, so I can't do this and be a judge too. So. Right, and I'm not a judge either. Okay, we're just here to support you all. Now, uh, attorney's fees. What do you think, Gary? Do you recommend sort of signing, like uh, putting that into sort of into your contracts? Sort of attorney fees? Because obviously, look, if you sort of, if it's not a contract and you actually need an attorney for whatever reason, Guess what? You are going to be paying for that attorney. Now, I know I've, I've written contracts, I've seen contracts, where actually it's part of the contract that if you're sort of held seen at fault, that you are actually going to be responsible for both parties' attorney's fees. What is your take on that? Today? Yeah, yeah that, that's pretty standard. Okay, okay it, it's almost a standard provision you'll see in any kind of, even a bank loan. You'll see if you go into default or some kinds of loans, you go into default on the loan. And they have to incur attorney fees to collect, and you know you're liable for them. Certainly, in any kind of a of a of an issue you have, that even customers, you know, when you when you sell a product to a customer, you'll see a standard provision in there that says, you know, if we get into some argument that your product isn't doing what you said it would, and we have to, you know, we're not going to pay you anymore. We get into a suit. You know, you're going to pay. We each pay our own attorney's fees until one of the parties is deemed to be responsible and then they're also then typically responsible for the other person's uh, fees. So it's just the way things are done. Yeah. Uh, a couple other is items here, and once again, really high level. You know, Mr. Masner talked about partnerships in the, you know, at sort of the beginning of this workshop. Please, 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 at the very beginning, write down and have a contract, and please get a, an attorney to help you with this, okay, uh, to, to create a contract on how you're going to work, okay? And it should be detailed. It should be, okay, what are you both putting in? What are you both getting out? What happens if one passes away? What happens? Or just leave. Or, 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 exactly, or just wants to leave, okay? It is absolutely critical you do this, okay? I mean, I, I, Gary, do you have any? I mean, I, I've just, I've not personally experienced, but I've been really close oh. to this, and it is absolutely a nightmare um, going through the court system, having the courts decide how they're going to divvy up things as opposed to the, the original partners. Or and that usually only happens years later when the thing is really worth something. You know, I mean, the Winklehaus brothers or whatever at, at Facebook is the classic example. You know, they come back, it wasn't an official agreement. They claimed it was their idea and they de and he developed it as a, you know, being paid by them and he sure. took it. So they were, you couldn't say they were founders, but there have been some other ones that, you know, where founders have left 
And unless you've got an agreement, they can come back and say, hey, I was a founder of that, and that's half of this thing is mine and stuff. So, you know, if you don't have the money to get an attorney, that's okay. Still write it down, and both of you sign it and have, you know, go down to the bank and have a notary yeah. uh, uh, witness your signature and stuff. Something is better than nothing. Okay, just and sit down and talk it through. Okay, we've had lots of examples where, for whatever reason, you know, one partner just said, "Gee, you know, I'm, I'm really not into this anymore. I'm leaving." But you know, unless whether it was the stock they got or the membership interest, unless there's something that says, <coughs> "Hey, you've got to stay here and you get vested," you know, for four years, you've got to stay here to be fully vested in your ownership position. If you leave, you know, you you get 25% for whatever year you stay or something and, and or you leave and you know I have the right to pay you out X bucks over some period of years for the work you put in or something. Just reach some agreement and get it written down. At least that's a starting point that you've got something to refer back to. If you don't have anything, then you're really in trouble. So yeah, it's best to if you can a lawyer and get something written up. Uh, it's going to cost you a few thousand bucks to do that. but. It, it just all depends on whether you got the money and how big a deal it is. And that's great advice. And, and lastly, you know, in terms of sort of managing this risk, is you will need an accountant. Okay, um, you will have to pay your taxes because I guarantee you, the IRS, you're not going to be able to hide from them, and you're definitely not going to be able to hide also from Miss Allison Eichley, who's a treasurer of Waldwater County, if you're doing your business here. Okay. Especially um, when she's your judge. Yeah, so she knows what you're doing. She so you're long story short is that's a great way to manage risk too. Okay. One question that I, I have. Yeah, you this. don't. You never want to get involved in tax fraud, right? No, that's, that's your end um, and stuff. And we'll talk. We we'll talk at all about accountants. We're not. I'm not going to go. Yeah. I mean, we're, I mean, we'll no, get to just, the finance yeah. aspect. We'll talk the, about that in the financial sure. section when we talk about how you set up your books and stuff. There's, there's real problems with, and, and we rely too much on I'm going to say this for, for lawyers, I'm going to generalize it right now, okay? What we say is, I trust you as a lawyer, you just do this for me. I'm not even going to read the thing, I'm going to sign it. Don't do that. Yes. Okay, read through every single friggin' word, you won't believe how many there are in these contracts and documents. It's ridiculous. It's um, but um, do it, and if you don't understand it, or it just seems to, you know, con Confine whatever it is, if you don't understand, ask your lawyer. Make them explain it to you. Okay, so that you understand it. it it's it's everything's pretty simple. They use, you know, very flower they use very specific wording, but you know, there's there's meaning behind every one of the clauses or sections in these things, and you ought to understand. Okay? So the so one question I had on this, Gary, for you was, you know, where where can Hawk Tank participants sort of find a good attorney or find a good accountant, right? I see some head nods, like I think that's, like where do you, where do you look? And I have some suggestions, but I'm curious but from your experience. It's a problem. <laughs> well, look, it's not a problem for this business plan. You're not gonna get, you know, we're sure. talking about if you really form this business, sure. right? And I just got, you know, again, it's the same thing that I was saying before, you know, true of accountants, true of lawyers, whether the accountants is a regular accountant or a tax accountant, but you know they need to have some experience in exactly what you're asking for. Otherwise, frankly, what they're going to do is go to their form database, which my company created for them 30 years ago, by the way, Automation Partners. But they're going to go to that. They're going to go to the same thing. They're going to go to their version of the same thing you could get online, and they're going to print and they're going to print these out, and it's going to be. And they're also very cautious because they don't want to come back and get dinged by you. So it's going to be very restrictive, very all this, very conservative, and you've got to decide whether that's what you want or not, whether it's in a contract with your customers or something else. You just have to decide that, okay? But they have to know what they're really doing because they have to understand what, you know, what they can do and can't do with you, and some of them, frankly, don't. And, you know, I find that, I think, I'll say more, we'll talk about it with the accountants, but, you know, so how do they find this? So for some well, so it's hard. Yeah. You know, ask people, ask other people, look at businesses that, that are, you know, ahead of where you are, okay, and it's kind of similar, and just talk to them, say, who do you use? You know, or talk to people. Um, 
We're going through this process right now, you know, with the sale I was talking about. There are no attorneys. Well, there's one who's maybe too busy, but I'm sure he's right. But, you know, there are no attorneys in this town where we happen to, I know a firm in Denver that we, we're going to use this guy who happens to be, a, was named the private equity lawyer in Colorado for last year. I mean, and he's charging a lot of money, but he said, so, and same with accountants, you know, you've got to figure out do they really understand corporate taxation or this or that that I'm asking for? Or do they understand how to set up the company the way I want the book set up and stuff? It, it, it's hard. I mean, you can go, there is a new uh, service, and you ought to look at this. Uh, so there, it's changed. I can never keep up with the big, just be the big A, big four, a lot of consolidation. But the big accounting firms, they really have expertise, and they have a way to share it across their company do all those things. There's one called KPMG, it's one of the big ones, and they have a service called Spark, KPMG Spark, where they're actually trying to reach out to small startup companies, help them do their accounting and tax stuff and billing and all these things, and they're trying to charge less money, they're hoping you're going to grow into a big company that can pay them a lot. And, you know, I find that to be a pretty good service, but, you know, there's no, you know, there's no magic solution to finding the right people. You just got to ask and get some references. And even ask the attorneys or the accountants for some references. So check them out. You know, talk to talk to people. Really get you know understand that that these people that you're hiring, which you really do need, but that they really under that they've got enough experience with your kind of company, what you're trying to do at your stage of life, that they can really be of service without. You know, charging you too much money. And I You'll love it. Shocked at what they charge. Yeah, asking asking businesses that are kind of in the same industry or same sort of what or what you sort of aspire to. Great idea. I think that you can sort of there are different types of round tables. The one that comes to my mind is sort of the Chamber of Commerce here, Draco Chamber of Commerce, and the number of round tables. Get involved in these. Go. They would love to have you come to these events. Um, if there's sort of any type of payment for these events, come talk to me. Jack Llewellyn, guess what? Is an alumna, as an alumnus of Fort Lewis College, loves Hawk Tanks, loves our students, and guess what? He would sponsor each and every one of you to attend those events. So go and talk to these businesses. Hey, who do you use, right? Um, you know, I don't know how Gary sort of feels about this. I'm kind of lukewarm. Is you know, even local bar associations have referral programs, right? Now. You know, it's, it, the reason why I'm lukewarm is because it's exactly because Mr. Masner's reaction. But through these referral programs, though, is a lot of times is actually they'll give you the first 30 minutes for free. And the reason why is that's when you're going to go and do your due diligence. That's when you're going to go and ask them these important questions that Mr. Masner has been talking about. Right? What is your experience in this? Can I talk to one of your clients and kind of see you know, how it's been working with them? Right? Uh, but definitely going and talking to the people that are already doing um, or what you aspire to, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a goal. And, and with each of them, make sure you sign an engagement letter, they're called, when you, when you hire a professional like that. Don't, and they're all going to want something, of, most of them will ask you for a $5,000 retainer or $2,000 sure. retainer against which they want it up front so they can start billing against it. But don't just leave it wide open for them. Give them very specific tasks, if you will. You know, write this contract for me, write this NDA for me, write this, write my bylaws, write something, and really get them to give you a price for that product, because otherwise you'll be really surprised at what they can build up to the time. Well, any questions for us, y'all? Anything at all? No? We'll end on this one here, and these are just some additional resources. If anyone wants any of the, the, my slides, you know, just email me, call me, they're yours. Uh, we're also putting together a good little resource page through Read Library that actually has a number of these presentations already on there as well as other resources that we have at Read all in one spot. I'll be sending that out to everyone probably within the next seven to ten days. So definitely keep a lookout for that one. Um, and if there's no other questions, then we'd just like to thank you once again for being here. And uh, we really enjoy this opportunity to work with all of you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Good stuff.